welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It is so great to be in this virtual space with you all again. Um, this is data, data everywhere, but what does it all mean with the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable? My name is Kinsey Keck. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with brown hair. Um, I, it's pulled back in a low ponytail today and I have long bangs and I'm wearing some big round uh, rose gold wire framed glasses and a sort of pinkish red brick colored uh, shirt. And my background is blurred, so you can't see anything behind me. Um, I am also the programming and membership manager for the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Uh, the Roundtable is a grassroots service organization that works to improve and advance the state of arts education through professional development, advocacy, and online resources and platforms connecting the arts education field. Although we are currently meeting online via Zoom, the Roundtable would like to acknowledge that we do work and live on unceded lands. Manahata, or the place that is widely known as New York City, exists on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Canarsi, Lenape, Mansi, and Wappinger people. These sovereign nations are uh, communities that still thrive here and we continue to occupy their lands. So we'd like to give a moment of respect to them as well as to the black and immigrant communities which have helped build the city that we know today. As we recognize that all of our past, presence and futures are intertwined, we just wanna uplift a few contemporary indigenous arts organizations that we can all support and learn from. Those are in the chat for you. Um, I recommend that you take some time to learn about those organizations, uh, support them with donations if you can, and please do feel free to share any resources or organizations in the chat that you would like to highlight. I also want to note that this session is being recorded and will be made available on the Roundtable's YouTube channel and website, and a link to the recording will be sent out to all registrants uh, probably next week. And that's it for me. So it is my sincere pleasure to introduce you all to our facilitator today, Dr. Bob Morrison. Uh, Bob has a long history as a supporter of music education and is widely recognized as one of the nation's leading advocates for music and arts and education and in society. He is the founder of Quadrant Arts Education Research, the nation's leading arts education research and intelligence organization. Dr. Morrison's leadership in research, public policy, and advocacy efforts has led to significant advancements in access to music and arts education programs across the nation. Bob, we are so excited to have you here with us. Please take it away. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Kinsey. And uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Bob Morrison, and I am the project director for the Arts Education Data Project and CEO uh, of Quadrant Research. And it's great to be with all of you in New York, and I see some familiar faces not from New York that are joining us today as well. Um, I see you, my ETA friends. Um, and I wanted to uh, uh, also just um, uh, reminisce for a moment because I spent several years uh, working in New York City when I was the CEO of the Save the Music Foundation from 1998 until 2003. So spent a lot of time working with New York City partners, with the New York City Department of Education, uh, to working to restore programs and, uh, and highlight uh, the, the benefits of music and arts education for uh, all of our students. I was involved in the first uh, blueprint that was de developed. I think we were working on that in 2002, 2003. Um, before I went off and uh, created my own organization. So I, I, and I am a frequent, you know, I'm always in the city. Uh, we're always going to shows, always coming into the city. So uh, New York City uh, holds a very special place in my heart, in my family's heart. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad to be with you today and to be able to share this information that we're going to talk about. Uh, a couple of things, if you have questions along the way, again, we're going to have a Q&A session. Uh, but if something strikes you afterwards, you can always send me an email. Uh, my email address is bob at artsedresearch.org. Uh, as well as a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today, you will be able to find at artseddata.org. That is the, the website that houses uh, the Arts Education Data Project. So with that, um, let's start talking about this thing we call arts education data. 
Uh, and a lot of times people ask me, you know, how did we get into this? How, do, how did you ever decide that this was, you know, a, a pathway to, to, to go uh, into as, as part of a career? And so I'll begin with the origin story. And the origin story starts when uh, back in 1988, I was a senior executive with a, uh, a company called Pearl. Uh, Pearl is a large um, musical instrument manufacturer in the percussion business. And we were getting ready to get into the education market. Uh, and so our executives tasked me with doing the research to you know, identify what's the size of the market, what's the market opportunity for our business. And so as part of that process, I started to ask some questions. And the first question that I asked was this. How many schools offer instrumental music programs? Because if we're in the instrument business, we'd want to know, well, how many schools are actually offering, you know, or, or, you know, in the market for instruments? And the funny thing was nobody could answer this question. Nobody knew how many schools had music programs. And I went to what was then the, the Music Educators National Conference, which is now called the National Association for Music Education. They didn't know. I went to NAM, the Trade Association. They didn't know. I went to the U.S. Department of Education. They didn't know. I went to the National Education Association. They didn't know. Nobody had a clue on how many instrumental music programs there were in the United States. And so that became, you know, really troubling to me that, you know, as a business person, I'm used to having, you know, metrics in order to measure success. And those things are like prof profit, loss, and market share. And I was really surprised that we didn't have any metrics in place to let us know whether or not our arts education programs were thriving uh, or were in decline. Sure, we, there were a lot of anecdotal stories that you would hear, but they were always from the perspective of the person in a particular community and may or may not have any relevance as to what was actually going on for music and arts education in the entire country. So this, was, this really began to bother me because there were important questions that were going unanswered. Questions like, um, you know, how many students are involved in arts programs? How many schools are offering arts education? How many teachers do we have? And in what arts disciplines are available for those students? What courses within those disciplines are available? Who has access? Who does not? And most importantly, how does any of this change over time? Are we increasing our participation rates or are we decreasing? Are we seeing more schools providing arts programs or are they decreasing? Do we have more teachers coming in or fewer? Uh, and these are important metrics to understand the health of our ecosystem within the arts education community. So when I had the opportunity uh, just after I left Save the Music in 2004, I was puzzling around this information regarding how do we deal with this data the lack of data. And a friend of mine was working at the California Department of Education at the time, and he alerted me to a data set that they had inside the California Department. So I immediately took advantage of the opportunity to look at that data. Uh, and uh, when we started to analyze it, it became clear that there was a significant problem in the state of California with their music programs. So what ended up happening is we released the report in 2004 called The Sound of Silence, The Unprecedented Decline in Music Education in California Public Schools, a Statistical Review. And we released that report because what we found at the time was there was a 50% decline in music participation at the elementary level between 1999 and 2004. And that set off some real alarm bells about, oh my goodness, if you know, if this keeps going in another five years, they're not going to have any music programs left in the state of California. So we use this report to really ring the bell out in California. And it got a lot of people's attention. It's got the California PTA's attention. It got Governor Schwarzenegger, who was governor at the time, his attention. And, and as a result, it became the catalyst for an investment in arts education of about a billion dollars to restore programs 
uh, in the state of California in response to what they had heard uh, from the findings of, of this particular report, as well as other reports that were coming out at the time. So when we did that, that, that kind of sent the message to us that, hey, maybe we're on to something here. Maybe there's something here with this data uh, research. So as a result, we then started doing uh, our own research in several other states. We started working with uh, first in New Jersey and then in Oklahoma in New Hampshire and Arizona and Michigan, uh, where we started to gather and report on the status and condition of arts education. But the way we were doing it at the time, we were actually going out and doing the surveys of the school. We were gathering the data from the schools. And it was clear at that point in time that that wasn't a sustainable model. So, so we started begin talking about there's got to be a better way. How might there be a better way to do this? And what conditions needed to change to make that possible? So some things started to happen uh, around 2007 that created the conditions where the arts education data uh, over time would become more widely available. And the first thing that occurred uh, was the release of the, or uh, the signing of the America Competes Act in 2007 by then President Bush. Uh, and the America Competes Act uh, actually really laid the foundation because it created a unique set of student identifiers. It required states to create student identifiers that will not allow the individual student to be identified by any user of the system. Uh, it would follow the student based on their enrollment, their demographics, and their course participation. And additionally, it would follow them when they enter or exit or transfer out of the system, drop out, or complete their P through 16 education program. So uh, this became the, the framework in order to begin to gather data and information on student participation. So the America Competes Act was really kind of the first step in that process. The second step in the process happened in 2009, um, because even though there was the America Competes Act requiring the tracking of this information, there wasn't unanimous decision around well, what information will it follow. And so we got involved uh, with our friends at C-Day to do a presentation for the Chief State School Officers Association and their, their IMAC group, which is all of their data folks from around the country, uh, to make a set of recommendations uh, to ensure that they would gather data on all core courses. Uh, and in October of 2019, they adopted uh, the recommendation to ensure that all data collection on school courses, teachers, and number of students enrolled should include core academic subject as defined by ESEA. Okay, very important because ESEA defines core academic subjects as English, reading, or language arts, mathematics, science, foreign languages, civics and government, economic arts, history, and geography. So that, that recommendation really helped then uh, seal the deal to ensure that arts education had a place at the table uh, when they were gathering data along with all the other courses. Uh, but then the last piece of the puzzle of the conditions that needed to change was this idea of, well, how do states gather information on courses? What, who defines what the courses are? And so uh, the, the CDA, our partners, as, as well as us at Quadrant Research, we worked with the National Center for Education Statistics to revise what they called their SCED codes, right? Their school courses for uh, exchange of data. And this is a national list of course codes that states could then adopt and integrate into their data systems that would allow uniform tracking of data across states. Uh, and at the same time, we helped them as they developed their inaugural set of what they call prior to secondary course codes so that now we had a full and robust system for um, gathering information uh, that included arts education. So this was a big step forward. But just because they gather it doesn't mean anything is going to happen with it. So what, what became clear is that we realize that the information exists, but states lack the funding or capacity to leverage the data, right? So they're gathering the data, they're gathering this information, but 90% of the data that our states are gathering languish and never are really unleashed with any real knowledge. So that led us to create the Arts Education Data Project. Uh, 
Uh, the Arts Education Data Project is a partnership between Quadrant Research and the State Education Agency's Directors of Arts Education, which is basically the department employees with authority and responsibility over arts education in every state department of education um, in the United States. So we're working uh, with our friends at CDAY and then with the support of some significant foundations, including the CMA Foundation, the Music Man Foundation, the William and Flory Hewlett Foundation, the NAM Foundation, and the Ohio Arts Council. They were our inaugural funders to help us get the project off the ground. And the setup of the project is pretty basic, where it's based on working with existing data acquired from state departments of education, been developed over the past 20 years, working with various state and federal agencies. And we're currently operating in 31 states, representing 65% of all the student population in the United States, with additional eight states in development for the end of 2023. At that point in time, we will hit about 87% of the total student population uh, of the country into the system. Uh, but I want to be clear uh, that the data is not the end, right? The data is a means to an end. And that end that we're targeting is to increase access to and participation in arts education for all students across the nation, all students across the nation. And I talked about the fact that we're operating in the 31 states. Here is uh, you know, the way the map looks today. And in 2016, we actually started with one in California and then built out from there. So now you can see over the past six years, the slow march that we've been taking across the country uh, in order to get more and more states involved. But what we wanna talk about today is New York. And what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time demo demonstrating for you is the data uh, system that we have developed and just recently launched with uh, uh, the New York State Department of Education, uh, which is the New York Arts Education Data Project. So what I'm showing you now is actually uh, the live project. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna refresh my screen here just because sometimes when it sits, it gets a little sleepy and I just have to refresh the system to wake everything back up again. Uh, but you can access it from artsaddata.org uh, and then there we, you'll see the map of the, of the United States. You click on the map and that will bring you to the New York dashboard. So here we're looking at the New York dashboards and I'm going to take you through uh, the, the organizing process and the logic model behind this, uh, as well as then go through some of the dashboards so you can understand how you can interact with it in your own work. So what we're looking at here is what we call our table of contents. And the table of contents basically shows you a list of all the dashboards that are available. So we've got an instructions and info dashboard. We have an overview dashboard. We have a county level dashboard. We have a district level dashboard with district level information. We have an arts discipline dashboard where you can explore information by individual disciplines. We have trends over time that allow you to see how has the data changed over the period of time based on the number of years of data that are in the system. We have a course finder where you can come in and say, I'm interested in seeing what schools are offering a particular course. Well, course finder will allow you to do that. You can look at the schools based on the number of disciplines and which disciplines they are offering on our disciplines offer dashboard. Comparisons where you can compare schools to one another or districts uh, to one another or several districts to one another. A school profile where you can look at what's happening in an individual school because we all know that the data is most powerful the closer it is to the user. And so if you have parent as a user, they think the state data is interesting, but they want to see this data for their school. And then we have a no arts dashboard, which, which allows us to explore where is it that students do not have access to arts instruction. So that can then be as used as a tool to uh, restore those programs or identify why those programs may not be in existence. So what I'm gonna do now is take you to the overview tab. Um, and this is where we always start because the overview really is a summary of what's happening with arts education in a particular state. So this is the summary for New York as a state. Uh, and over the top line, we have our key performance indicators. So here we're looking at arts enrollment Overall arts enrollment in the state of New York is 80% or 80.5% of all students in the state participate in arts education. 
And there are 4.3% of students in the state that don't have access to any arts instruction. We'll show you where those schools are in a moment. Uh, we also then show you that we're talking about 4,741 schools impacting 2.6 million students. Of the 2.6 million students, there's 2 million students that are enrolled in the arts, and there are 112,000 students that get up every day and go to school that do not have access to any arts instruction uh, in the state of New York. That is your 4.3%. So these are our key performance indicators that just kind of sets for us you know, what it is that we're looking at for the state. And the way the data is broken down now is at three different levels. Uh, the first level is unique arts. So that's where we get a distinct or unique count of any student that's enrolled in any arts discipline what's, whatsoever. The second level we look at is unique discipline. So there we're, look, we're looking at a unique count of students that are involved in, uh, in a specific discipline uh, making sure that we dedupe those students if they're in multiple courses within those students, but still counting them uniquely if they're in music and, and visual art. They're counted both as a participant in music and also as a participant in visual art. And then the lowest level is the course level. And the course level granularity allows us to look at the enrollment by, by specific courses. So that's the data structure, unique arts, unique discipline, and unique course enrollment. So right off the bat, at the top level here, we're gonna look at information regarding unique arts. So we know that 96% of the students in the state of New York have access to arts instruction. 94% of the students um, uh, or schools actually provide access. However, when you look at the state requirements, only 15% of students attend schools that, where they have access to the state requirements and only 10% of schools are actually providing those state requirements to those students. Now, when as you move between states, those requirements change wildly. So those those percentages will often change. But based on New York state code, um, those are the numbers that we have. Then we look at enrollment by free and reduced lunch. So what's the percentage of students that are enrolled based on the percentage of students involved in free and reduced lunch at the individual school? And here you can see that low free and reduced lunch has 83%. Uh, but as it moves across, it declines when you get to high free and reduced lunch down to about 74%. And the next thing we look at then is arts enrollment by grade level. So we're looking at elementary, middle, and high school. And you can see, you know, pretty solid uh, numbers for elementary and middle school, even when we look out across the, the, the country. 96% of elementary school students are participating, 93% of middle school students. 55% of high school, and that dip at the high school level is something that we see across the country uh, as students you know, move out of uh, interest in arts and into other areas. And then 73% for mixed schools. Mixed schools are uh, really those grade levels that don't fit into the traditional elementary, middle, high. So those are K-8s, K-12s, 712 or odd configurations. The vast majority of them tend to be charter schools. So the next level that we look at is unique by uh, unique enrollment by the individual discipline. So here we see that 61% of students in the state of New York are enrolled in music. And then when you hover over, it will give you the breakdown for elementary, middle, high, and mixed grades. So you can see how that stair steps down. And the same thing for visual art at 65%. Uh, then we have our theater courses at 11%. And you can see the grade level participation breakdown. Um, and dance, which I think is a really interesting story in New York, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. And then the lowest level is, lowest level granularity that we're looking at is course. So here, the course with the greatest enrollment is elementary music, right, with 1.1 million students, and elementary art that has 1.2 million students. So you can see the different, uh, and elementary dance has almost 300,000 students uh, enrolled. But you can come down here and see the individual course enrollment. Each of these dots represents a course and the height represents the number of students that are involved. Or we can take a look at it by schools. So instead we'll use the, the menu here to now look at this based on the number of schools. And we can see that um, music in grade six is in 1,000 schools and concert band is in 1,300 schools. So it's another way to take a look at the data. 
So now that I've showed you kind of how this works, uh, I now want to take you through uh, how you can use and interact with the data uh, on this page. So say I was just interested in looking at the elementary information, I would just click on the elementary bar and the entire screen now refreshes. So now we're just looking at elementary uh, arts education for the state of New York. And maybe I'm interested in looking at elementary in high free and reduced lunch. So I can combine those two together. And now I'm looking at uh, what does arts education look like in elementary schools where uh, the, the schools are identified as serving high free and reduced lunch students. So uh, interesting way that you can interact it with that um, uh, by just using uh, the, the bars. But we also then have a help button um, which will give you an overlay to display uh, information about how to interact with the information. But every dashboard has a filter. And if you click on the filter, it will then allow you to filter the information based on county or based on district or based on traditional versus charter school or by locale type. So if I just wanted to look at what does arts education look like in our major urban centers across the state, I would select city large. And now everything has been refreshed to show me the status of arts education in those communities designated as large cities across the state of New York, uh, which is about, you're looking at about a third of your population and you're looking about 80% of your students that don't have access to arts are in those communities. So I'm gonna clear that particular filter. So say you wanted to just look at a particular county. So let's say we just wanted to look at New York's uh, uh, Manhattan. So we would go to the county of New York, which is basically Manhattan. Uh, and now we're looking at what does arts education look like for uh, the Manhattan area or the county of New York. And here you can see the number of schools, the number of students without access, um, and, and how the data changes. Notice that the students without access rate went to 10.2%. Uh, versus the 4% that we saw for the state. So uh, that's one of the ways that you can interact with the data. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can compare uh, charter schools to traditional schools. So if we look at traditional schools, the data is going to show me that across the state, uh, we've got an 83% enrollment rate and 29,000 of the 112,000 students without access to arts education are in our traditional schools. But if I come look at this and just look at charter schools, this will now show us the view for charter schools. And it shows us that students without access in charter schools in the state of New York is 52%, 52%. And if we look at the students without access number, 83,000 students, three quarters of the students that do not have access to arts education in the state of New York attend a charter school, right? So to me, that sends off policy alarm bells. Why is that? It, it, it just, it brings up, you know, a, a series of questions that you would wanna begin to ask. And that's just one, I'm not picking on charter schools, but that was a number that jumped out at us. And that's how the data can be valuable uh, as you're going through looking at uh, how to use this for your own work. So now what I'm gonna do is just take you through a couple of the other dashboards so that you can then understand how the functionality works um, uh, before we get to Q&A. So the next dashboard that we look at is the county level dashboard. Here you can come in and compare how does a particular county that you're interested in compare with others. And since we just did um, New York County, I could come in here and just type the name and it will bring up New York County. And now it shows me how New York County fares against all of the other counties in the state. Uh, and you can see that New York County is low when it comes to visual arts compared to all of the other counties. It's actually low when it comes to music participation when compared to all of the other counties. Uh, but it's actually pretty good when it comes to theater and really good when it comes to dance. So again, it allows you to interact with the information in a different way. Uh, or you can just come in and look at all of the counties together. And what you're getting down below is the top 10 counties based on enrollment rate and the bottom 10 counties based on enrollment rate. So you can come in and see who are, who are, where are the communities that are doing well, where are the communities that may be 
uh, could use some additional support. And you can change the view based on enrollment rate or students without access or school access rates or student access to the required arts or schools offering the required arts. So you can come in, change the variable, uh, and again, a help button is always there for you to look at. Uh, the next one that I want to share with you is district level information, right? So last one, we were looking at county. Now we want to look at districts. And because the map was so um, uh, difficult to work with, particularly when it came to New York City, we've actually pulled out New York City uh, and the 20, or the 33 districts that make up New York City into its own little map here so that it's a little easier uh, to work with. But here, what this information you're looking at now, we're looking at all state overview, but we're breaking down schools based on majority race ethnicity. So that means if there's 50% plus one student uh, of a specific race or ethnicity, that school then is designated to that majority race ethnicity. So you were looking at majority black, Hispanic, uh, no majority, majority white schools, or schools where there is uh, no specific majority in them whatsoever. Then we're looking at it based on schools that are identified based on their free and reduced lunch student percentage. So low, mid, low, high, high. And you can see how all of the schools in the state are distributed amongst that area. Uh, the map is color coded based on being above or below the state average for arts participation. And then we're giving you the enrollment trend over the three year period. Now, the data that we have in currently is for uh, the 20, um, 2018, 2019, and the 2020 school year. So we take you up to the beginnings of COVID, but not into COVID. And we will have that data at the next data released from the state, and we'll integrate that information here. But now what we can see is using the, the, the map or using the filter, you can use the filter to say, I wanna look at a particular district and you can come in and type in a particular district name or you can use the map. So let's say I wanted to look at district number two. I would come over, I'm just clicking on district number two on the map uh, for New York. And now it's refreshing all the information so that I can see how do the schools in district, in, in, in district two compare to the state? So the dark blue line is always the district and the dark gray line is always the state average. So you can see how the majority black schools in district two are way overperforming what the state average is. The state average for majority black schools and participation in the arts is 64%, whereas the participation uh, here in district two is 100%. That to me probably means that we're looking at two elementary schools in that particular area versus majority Hispanic schools where the majority Hispanic uh, participation at the district level here is 61% when compared to the state level at 79%, right? So it provides context for how you're seeing the district number versus the number for the category versus the number for the state. Same thing with free and reduced lunch. Uh, and then down below, it will show you the number of schools that are offering music. Uh, it will show you the music enrollment. It will show you the number of courses. It will show you the number of teachers. And it will show you the enrollment percentage for each of those years. So now you can interact with the information and get more granular about what's happening in a particular district. So in District 2, we see 39 schools are offering dance with 14,000 students enrolled. Um, and so again, gets you more granular into that information. Arts disciplines. Some people say, I'm not interested in all arts. I wanna know what's happening in my particular discipline. So the arts discipline tab will allow you to come in and look at the information based on the individual discipline. So you click on an icon, it will give you the information for the discipline. Uh, the, the map is a county map. Uh, that shows you the darker the color, the, the greater the intensity of student enrollment um, you know, in, in those counties. And then we're giving you the enrollment in courses um, that are available for that particular discipline, and then breakdown by gender, great breakdown by grade level, and breakdown of participation by free and reduced lunch. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to show you here is uh, dance. And you know, with dance, and, and I love the dance story in New York because dance participation in New York is greater than any other place in the country. Um, so when we talk about where are there things to celebrate, dance in New York should be celebrated because it is, uh, while the map, it's not everywhere, 
Um, it is still more robust in the state of New York than it is in any other state um, in, in the country. Um, but you remember, if we go back to the overview page, what the overall participation in dance was, right? So 10%, 10% of students in the state participate in dance. But come back to the arts disciplines, and that's when we're counting those students that are in dance compared to all the students in the state. But then we created this thing that we call an uptake rate. And the uptake rate allows us to look at, well, what's the participation rate based on where the discipline is offered, right? So the program uptake rate for dance in the state of New York is 49%. So where dance is offered, 49% of students are actually choosing to participate. That's a, that's a great number uh, to, and, and a great way to show that it's not that there's a lack of interest in dance. There's a lot of interest in dance. It's just that dance doesn't have the same penetration rate programmatically that you see with music and visual art. So an interesting way to look at that information uh, on this discipline uh, dashboard. Uh, the next one that I want to show, share with you is for those that are data geeks and you want to know what's happening with, tre with trends over time, this is our trends over time dashboard. As I mentioned before, how does any of this change over time? And this dashboard allows us to look at, okay, well, how are we doing? And we can see over the three-year period that there was a decline in students of total enrollment in the state of 1.3%. But our arts students number actually stayed the same. But our overall arts enrollment rate increased by 1.3% because the students decreased by 1.3%, even though we stayed the same. Uh, access to required arts improved by 13%. Schools without access declined by 18%, which is good. Students that don't have access to arts instruction went from um, 134,000 students in 2018 to 112,000 students uh, in 2020. And our arts teachers you know, increased slightly from 32,000 in 2018 to 32,900 in 2020. So this is the barometer. This is the information that we look at to say, are we moving in the right direction or are we moving in the wrong direction as it relates to what's happening with arts education? And then we can look at what's happening within some of our subgroups that we've been looking at, like free and reduced lunch or majority race ethnicity. And we can use the map over here to look at the information based on a variety of different rates, whether it's arts enrollment rate or students or arts students or any of the other metrics that we have above. But what I wanted to call your attention to here is we can see based on free and reduced lunch that our high free and reduced lunch schools or students that are in our high free and reduced lunch area um, are, are participating at a rate significantly lower than what we're seeing in the other categories. However, it is improving. It's improved significantly from where it was in 2018 at 67% to where it is now at 74%, that's still below the 80% state average and well below uh, the mid-low category that has 85% participation. So now we're beginning to look at some equity issues that are revealing themselves in the data. The next graph that we look at over here, arts, majority by, uh, arts enrollment by school majority race ethnicity, you can see that in schools where the students are majority white, that we've got higher level of arts participation at 85% than 84% and then down to uh, again 84% in the current uh, in 2020 yet we see that schools where the majority of students are black the 631 schools in the state where that happens their participation rate is significantly lower at 60% in 2018 64% in 2019 and and, tw and 2020 so again, this information now begins to reveal itself and then you can use the filters to come up here and look at particular counties. So now if I wanna come back and we just use New York County because that's the game we've been playing today, I'll refresh this and now we're gonna look at the data just for New York County. Um, and it will now tell us uh, even more of a story regarding to what's happening. So you can see um, arts enrollment rate um, in New York County, you can see how uh, art students have increased. The enrollment rate has increased over the three-year period. Everything's moving in positive directions. 
Uh, but here you see the real difference between students in low free and reduced lunch, where 97% of the students are participating versus students that are in um, high free and reduced lunch, where 63% of the students are participating. So there's your equity issue in the county of New York in very sharp relief, right? Very stark relief for you to take a look at. And then the same thing as it relates to enrollment by race, ethnicity. Now, the data doesn't tell us why. It just tells us what. We don't know why that is, right? That's the, that's the big question that we want the answers to. But what, what the data does do is it provides us directionality on what we need to be looking at. So the data is the what to then bring up the questions to help you understand the why. And that's where the, the round table comes into place because these are all po these are policy implications that this data is, is providing. Down below, we're showing you uh, participation uh, in the individual disciplines. And then we're showing you over the period of time the courses that had the highest increases and the highest decreases uh, over the period of, of time. So with that, I'm going to just go to um, a couple other things just very quickly. We have the course finder that I mentioned to you where I can come in here, say, I want to know where, where are the schools where all the students are involved in AP music theory. And I hit the apply. And now it's going to give me a list of all the students and map all the schools where AP music theory is available in the state. So if you want to come in and look at like where are dance classes or where is this particular course being offered, uh, this is the dashboard for you. Disciplines offered, this is a way to uh, get an understanding of, I'm interested in seeing which schools are offering music and dance, or I'm interested in schools that are offering visual art and theater. You can use these drop down menus to check either yes or no if it's an attribute that you're trying to look at. So if I wanted to find all the schools that are not offering music in the state, I would just hit no and it will then refresh and show me the list of all the schools that are not offering music. Um, so if you're a, 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 a presenter and you want to target schools that are not offering a particular course because you have an offering to fill that area, you can use this as a way to target uh, schools. Uh, we have a way to compare schools with one another um, or districts where you can come in and just select a particular uh, district here. I've got a, a charter community and I'll compare them to Bethlehem Central and uh, Albany um, community. And it will show, show you all of the schools and how they compare uh, in those areas. Or I can just control select individual schools. So I can select just Albany School District and Bethlehem School District, and I'll just be looking at, at those particular districts. Uh, school profile, as I mentioned, gives you the individual profiles of the schools where it will show you um, the number of teachers, the, num the percentage of students that are enrolled, uh, the enrollment by grade level, the changes over time, the courses that change over time. And if you click on the course year count, it will actually show you the courses and you can hover over the course to see what was the enrollment in that course in that school for a given year. So if there's a particular school that you're interested in working with, this can be a tool to do uh, some additional research. The last thing that I'm gonna share with you is the No Arts page. Um, and again, this allows us to take a look at uh, what does Students Without Access look like you know, across the state. Has it improved over time? Yes, it has been improving over time. Where are they concentrated? Well, there's a big concentration in, you know, the, those mixed schools. And, and is there specific school types that are overrepresented? And here, the black bar shows you the distribution of all students uh, based on the categories compared to the distribution of no art students. So you can see whether or not a category is overrepresented. And here you can see that majority black schools and majority Hispanic schools are overrepresented based on their no art students versus schools that are majority white or schools that have no majority. And you can also see the concentration that arts are not offered in 56% of the charter schools, 33, 313 charter schools, 56, half of those charter schools are not offering arts instruction. So again, if you wanted to use the filter up here and we could select the counties and I can go, let's look at, at the five counties that make up uh, New York. So we've got Kings, we've got the Bronx, come on, 
Uh, we've got New York. Um, we've got Queens. We've got Richmond. I apply that. Now we're going to look at what does this information look like just for New York City. And there you are, 197 schools without access to arts instruction, 87 um, thousand students, which is more than three quarters of all the students in the state that don't have access are concentrated in New York City. So you can begin to use this as a way of identifying where those districts are, identifying where those schools are, and what does that mean or what might that mean for how you might approach uh, trying to uh, improve that. Oh, by the way, uh, the charter number went from 56% to 64% when we focused just on uh, the, the, the five boroughs of Manhattan. So uh, with that, just two other things that I just wanted to touch on real quickly. Uh, we just released a national report at the beginning of June called the National Arts Education Status Report, which shows what's happening with arts education across the country, where we've actually begin, we've, we've been able to combine data representing 30,000 schools and about 36% of all students in the country to paint a picture of what does arts participation and access look like across the country. Uh, so this information is again available at the Arts Education Data Project website. And we even have a summary report that our good friends at the NAM Foundation put together that was d delivered to members of Congress um, back in September 14th, uh, beginning to paint the picture about the fact that the that while the vast majority of our students do have access to these programs, there is there are still millions of students that don't, and they happen to fall in particular categories that we should be concerned about. So uh, it enables us to actually target our advocacy efforts to the areas of need as opposed to being more generalized. And it allows us to embrace the fact that arts education is strong across the country, but we do have areas and pockets that uh, where students are denied those opportunities that we need to, to focus on. So we can weigh into our strength while also owning where those uh, no art students um, uh, are attending schools. So we can really target efforts to bring the arts to those particular communities across the country. And with that, I'm going to stop uh, and we will answer any questions that you have. We're not going to be formal here. Um, I think uh, Kinsey is going to be the traffic cop, but I think you can just, uh, you know, either raise your hand or unmute or whatever she wants you to do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. And I just want to share, I'm sure you haven't been able to see the chat because you've been presenting, but people are floored by this incredible resource. So thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through it. We do have a lot of questions already. I want to let folks know that we do have a hard stop at 11. So we'll get to as many of the questions as we can. Um, and thank you all so much for sticking with us and for sharing your questions. So the first one um, is from Lauren. Lauren asks, is this information generated solely by the state ed departments or does this require individual districts to provide updated info each, each year? Yeah, the districts are required by the state to submit their data on an annual basis. So the data is actually generated from the district to the state, the state then aggregates it together. We then, you know, pull the data from the state as part of our data sharing agreement. Um, so if, if a school you know, district or a school says, well, that's not right, that data is not right, you know, they got to look at themselves in the mirror because they are the ones that are reporting the data. So if there's incorrect data being reported, this is an opportunity for them to um, uh, look at how they're reporting and improve their reporting, you know, to the state but it is coming from the districts to the state as, as required by state law. Excellent, thank you. Um, our next question is from Melissa who asks, is there a fee for states to participate in the Arts Ed Data Project? Yes, we individual states, we have contracts with each of the individual states to participate uh, in the project. Uh, there's an initial fee that it costs them uh, for the, the first year setup. Uh, and then the corresponding years uh, are a lot less because once we have the data set up, we're able to bring it in individually. So yes, we have a standardized fee for each of the states that participate. Lovely. Okay, so we have three questions that I feel like are all sort of touching on similar things. So I'll share those together. Um, the first is, do any of these metrics include on-site after-school offerings? And no. are there plans to include that data in the future? No, and see, this is the, 
this is a little bit of the conundrum because you know you know one of the things that we say is uh, don't let the perfect be the en enemy of the good. In a perfect world, we would have that data being reported by districts to the state. We are getting the data from the state departments of education and the data that they are gathering from the districts are the data that they require from the districts. Uh, data on after school programs and partnerships is not something that the state is gathering information on. So as a result, you know, that's something that we do not have access to. And that's why, you know, with our original model where we were surveying school districts to compile the data, where we were able to bring that information in, it just wasn't scalable. There was no way to try to do that on a national basis, which is why we ended up shifting the model to be able to work with data that is existing in the state departments of education and pulling it in from, from there. So that is, you know, one of the downsides is we don't include the information regarding the after school programs, but at the same time, we're providing all of the other information, the good that we are able to mine from the Department of Education data. Excellent, thank you. So Kevin, Lauren, and Krista, I feel like you all asked questions about arts partnerships and the after school offerings. So if there's your answer for that. Um, here's a specific but, but question. It is a yeah. But this is a tool now, this is a tool that you can use to support your programs. So even though that information isn't there, uh, there's a lot of information that is there that will allow you to utilize it uh, as, a, as a way to support your, your, your own after school uh, uh, programmatic offerings. Lovely. Um, our next question is very specific, and I don't know if you'll have the answer offhand or quickly. So if not, that's totally fine. But um, we've been asked, what is the total number of children in New York City and New York State who don't have any access to arts education in their school, public and charter combined? In, in the city, it's 112,000 uh, public charter. Um, and if we just go and, and, and it was right on the dashboard. So this is the number in New York city, right? So i I filtered this down to the five counties, uh, that make up or the five boroughs of New York, 87,000 students do not have access to arts instruction in, in the five boroughs of Manhattan. And in the state, if you go to the overview page, uh, where we started, uh, the, the state number is 112. Right. And remember that when I broke that down, a big chunk of that was centered in uh, in charter schools. So 112,000 uh, statewide of that 112,000, uh, we're talking about uh, 87,000 in uh, the metro New York area. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for bearing with me as I'm rapid firing these at you, <laughs> but we're getting through them. Which bring, up, bring them on, bring them on. Yeah. <laughs> um, Melissa asks next, is there any data collected on who it is that is teaching the arts, uh, specifically like certifications? Any information on that? So, you know, the information that we're getting currently is the student, the unique, I'm sorry, the unique teacher code that is providing the instruction. Um, and depending on the state and depending on their governing laws, um, certification can vary widely. So what I mean by that is, you know, in some states, um, elementary teachers are certified to teach anything in the elementary school, basically, right? Um, versus uh, arts instruction being provided by a uh, certified arts teacher, right? Who has certification in the arts discipline. And that's one of the things we actually met with many of our states yesterday and we were talking about how do we refine the teacher data? How do we improve the teacher data so that it can be used as a tool, not only to look at certified teacher versus classroom teacher or certified teacher versus non-certified teacher in the arts, but also get additional information that will allow us to use that as barometers to address um, the, the concerns that exist around the teacher shortage in the United States. Uh, that certainly exists in New York State, uh, and the arts education community is not immune to those shortages right now. So uh, we are exploring how to make that data robust right now. What it reflects is the, that there is a person um, that has uh, been assigned to teach that course that is being reported in the data. I can't tell you 
uh, with any veracity, whether that person is certified or not. My guess would be that middle school, high school data is going to be mostly certified teachers uh, and that the elementary data, I'm, I'm going to be less confident to say that the, all those folks would be, be sort of certified teachers. But that is something, one of the improvements that we are looking at to, to do with the states. Amazing. Thank you. Um, a couple of clarifying questions next. The first is, um, is this just kindergarten to K to 12 schools or other age ranges included? No, K-12 public education. Uh, public and, and public education includes charter, because charter schools are public schools. Uh, it does not include uh, private, parochial, or any of those schools that are not governed by the Department of Education. Perfect. That was the next question. So you're one step ahead of me. Um, our next question is from Hannah. And Hannah, I will invite you to come off of mute if you want to add anything to your question. Um, but Hannah asks, where would you advise users of this amazing data aggregation to dig a little deeper? And are there any caveats they should be mindful of as they use the data to make the case for their work? I didn't understand quite the first part. Hi, Kinsey, do you want me to jump in? Please do. Hi, thank you so much for sharing this amazing data. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if you could caution us about anywhere that we should be mindful where perhaps at the aggregate level data has been smoothed out um, or is perhaps captured in different ways, you know, perhaps from district to district or county to county. We want to be deploying this data um, well and authentically, but should we be sensitive to or be mindful of caveats um, so that we're not uh, sounding perhaps catastrophic alarm bells where they are maybe undue. So, you know, I, I think the one caveat that, you know, that you always use is that this data is data reported by the districts to the Department of Education. And the veracity of the data is, um, you know, is, is really based on uh, the attention to detail that the districts, you know, uh, put into it when reporting. Um, so when it comes to um, aggregated versus disaggregated, one of the reasons why we provide the data in such a way that it can be disaggregated is because of the fact that at an aggregated level, it's, things are going to be hidden, right? It's the stuff is going to be hidden uh, regarding equity issues that as, as we walk through the presentation that we were able to reveal. As I started pulling back layers of the onion, all of a sudden it was just like, oh, wow, that revealed itself as being an issue that we need to take a look at. So depending on uh, where your point of view is, right? So if you, if you have a state point of view, I would advise you one way. If, if you're working in a particular district, I would look at it from the standpoint of going, okay, how does our district compare to the state? Or also on that comparisons tab, you can actually identify districts based on attributes. So if you wanted to look at large high schools that are majority Hispanic, that are located in cities, you can filter the schools to that level so that you're creating, you know, for lack of a better term, a peer group for comparison. So if you're a district, that's how I would utilize it, is how do we compare with our peer groups with this information, A, and then B, what's underneath our district information? What does it look like by school? What concerns might we have um, of inequities that exist within the schools within our own communities? Because that's the way parents are gonna look at it. The parents gonna look at their school and go, oh, this is what's happening in my school. Why is it that my, my, why is it that my students don't have access to the same programs that are offered in a school down the street? So I hope that answered it. And if not, you can send me an email to bob at artsedresearch.org uh, and we can set up a time for a conversation uh, if it needs a little bit more explanation. Ooh, thank you, Bob, so much for answering all those questions. We do have a handful more, but it is 11.01. Um, I'm curious if you would be open to maybe me sending you those via email and I could share your responses yep. with these folks. Okay, wonderful. So yes. if you didn't get your answer question, do not fret. Um, I will connect with Bob offline and share you his responses to those questions. I just wanna say one more really big fantastic thank you so much 
to you, Bob, for spending this hour with us and walking us through this incredible resource. Um, folks, Oh, they're asking if we can share your email again. I will share that in the follow-up email with everybody. Um, and I think you can see it on Bob's screen right there. It's bob at artsedresearch.org. And I just want to say thank you to you all so much for, for joining us for this incredible conversation. And um, we hope to see you all soon. I will be sending an email with a link to the recording of this answers from Bob for the questions that weren't uh, touched on today and his email address and any other resources. Um, Bob, thank you. Thank you all. Pleasure to be with you today.